right now. Let me know when we're live so that I can be... It says we're live. I'm putting up the link right now. Okay. Oops. Whenever I look at uh, the lower corner of my screen, I look like I'm... Then I look at the camera, try to look real quickly. Oh, and I see my eye movements just changing over, just the annoying thing. Yeah, I think we're live now. Yeah, we get... There you guys are! Okay! Remove the glasses. <laughs> Hi, this is Laura Isley with Full Circle Magic. We're having our special, the holdout lecture Q and A today with Robin Channing, and I would like to introduce y'all to Robin. Say hi, Robin. Hi, Robin. Don't mind me. That's just me being literal. That's just an attempt at sense of humor. All right. So FCM, the holdout. How is everybody doing today? What's the response to that, Laura? Looking and sounding great. Oh. Good. This is sort of, I guess I need you to be my eyes and ears to everybody else that's out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, uh, I have to keep on my glasses, folks, so I can see what you're saying. So, Okay. <laughs> All right. You go ahead and start us off, and then when you're ready to accept questions, just let us know. Okay. I'm going to, all right, if everybody is ready with your kind permission, I'm going to start us off with something involving... Well, I wish you could involve the $100 bill, but for our purposes, we'll have to work with something half as good. Which Everybody's good. saying hello. Hello. Okay, so what you are about to see, and this is an excerpt from my professional. What you're about to see, ladies and gentlemen, is an example of sleight of hand, okay? And there it is. Okay. And even though I can't see everybody here, I get the sense of some, ooh, some sense of being less than impressed. Okay, especially for you magicians that know about what's about to happen here. I'm going to do some more sleight of hand, okay? More sleight of hand. It looks like this. And especially because I can't see you, I get the feeling that some of you are underwhelmed. Well... That's the nature of sleight of hand, ladies and gentlemen, as you well know, because sleight of hand takes on the appearance of very innocent, innocuous actions. But beneath that innocent guise lies some very ulterior motives, some hidden designs, which, when properly executed, yields a very different result. And check it out. That's George Washington for you right there. Now, of course, if this were a borrowed bill, which it always is, except for now, I would say, oh, thank you very much. And they'll be like, oh, I just lost $49. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. I have to be a little more honest about it than that. Now check it out because it's not just that I'm going to restore it. I'm also going to provide a challenge scenario. Check it out. You will notice that as I fold this bill, at no point do I ever cover it from view. You are always able to see it no matter how small it gets. Furthermore, you will notice that at no point do I ever employ any so-called quickness of the hands because you will notice that everything is happening relatively slowly. And once again, there is our friendly President Grant. And there it is. Very cool. Okay. Now, uh, I guess I can start with the uh, the explanation. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. We're ready to start with the explanation. Okay. Now. Yeah. Go. Now, um, thumb tip bill change. It's pretty common in magic. Uh, this is my take on it. Now, there are two objectives to achieving a really good thumb tip bill change, and it's what I described in the second uh, fold there, where I say. You have to keep it in view the whole time, and the hands have to be really slow, okay? So first things first, you're going to need a thumb tip, like so. I use a rubber thumb tip for reasons that I will explain later. And 
It can be a matching flesh color, you know. Preferably, it's good. Close as you can get. And you got to set up the bill, the other bill, in the following manner. In this case, a one. Okay. Now, the way I do this, now this is relative to me, okay, so just uh, keep that in mind. Relative to me in the sense of where, when I fold it. When I say I'm going to fold it to the right, that means you're, you're going to see left, but anyway. Okay, so anyway, here are the guidelines. <laughs> Whenever you're holding a bill for a bill change, hold it from the lower corners. Now, if you hold it from the upper corners like this, it really looks like the hands are kind of surrounding the bill, but if you hold it by just making that one change, holding it by the lower corners, you get the impression that the hands are much further away from the bill. And thus, you're giving the subliminal suggestion that you're not really, you know, you're not really manipulating the bill per se, because it, it, it's further away from the hands. Like this, okay, yeah, surrounding. It looks like you're in, you know, in total control, you're manipulating. But here, further away, it's also further away from the hands. It's a more good subliminal, you know, look. And also, it looks much more open. Now, the folding procedure is very simple. Very simple, okay? To the right and down. To the right and down. And then 180. Does that make sense? Following. Following. See that? You're, you're here. And also, notice that all the folds are away from you. Never towards yourself, but always away from yourself. Always, okay? So... All the folds are away to the right, away and down, away to the right, and away and down, and then 180, okay? Now, I know I talk fast, so I just wanted to uh, repeat that in case anybody missed any details. Now, you, you know you're in the right position for this bill change because the bill is in kind of a V shape at the edge, and you want your thumb to be not on the whole length of the bill, but only halfway like so, okay? Halfway. The reason being is that you want to have friction of the thumb against the bill so that as you insert said bill into the thumb tip, like so, all you have to do is just remove the thumb and by friction the bill comes out with it, okay? Halfway onto the bill, into the thumb tip, you are ready to go, okay? So far so good? All right. Yes, sir. Now, you show the bill like so. $100 bill, okay? Now, as you put around, like so, you can, I just did a move just now, okay? Just now I just did a move. And that move is simply to remove the thumb tip partially off the thumb. That can happen by friction. You just go like this, and look, see? The reason why you want this bill partially off the thumb tip is so that later on, instead of having to fight to pull it off all the way, because it's already halfway off, pulling it off the rest of the way is a piece of cake. It's very minimal effort. Okay? And because you can go like this, you can also do the same thing, but with the bill between said fingers. And there, see? I just did it. It's halfway off. Okay? Now, yeah. you're in this position. The, bill, the thumb tip is halfway off the thumb already. And the folding procedure is just like how you prepared the other bill. You're, again, you're holding it from the lower corners. To the right and down. To the right and down. Now also, you'll notice that as I push the bill from this position, I don't do this just to fold it in half because that covers the bill from view. No, you don't want to do that. You want to fold the bill. You can actually go ahead and pre-crease the center but you want to keep as much of the bill in view as possible so that as you fold it over, instead of having one or more fingers to push it over all the way, you want to have the fingers push it over such that the fingers are, look, they're at the edge of the fold right there. So you can, keep, you can continue to see the bill in view. That's important. Like this. And then once the bill is here, watch. This thumb can just steal that thumb tip off into the left fingers right then and there. And then you nest the other bill behind the lower half of this, and then you just fold that down, and there it is, okay? So let me do that again at speed, all right? Starting from the top, you like this. The thumb tip is already halfway off to the right. And again, 
You're, when you fold it over, you have to keep the fingers at the edge of the fold. Down, same thing. You want to keep the bill as, as much in view as possible. I reach over just to pre-crease the bill and then fold it to the right. The thumb tip's already here. The second bill is already there. And then this one gets folded down thusly. Now, the change of the bill, the switch of the bill, is such that I don't just go like this and, you know, whatever. I tilt both bills 90 degrees this way such that the audience actually sees both bills edgewise. Okay? This also helps opening the $1 bill to be easier because you'll notice that the V is over here. All you have to do is just insert inside here into the upper bill because it's already 90 degrees down. You just have to insert like this and then unfold like this. Okay, so from the top you're here, turn it 90 degrees, insert in here, and all it just does is insert and then just pinches and then you just unfold out the rest of the way. The bills have been switched. Okay, now to insert the bill into the thumb tip, but you don't want to insert it all the way because if you were to insert it all the way, that creates too much movement. So you have to break it down into smaller moves. At first things first, you want to create a gesture. Now what I just did just now was in the act of going like this, I actually inserted this bill halfway into the thumb tip. Not all the way, just halfway. The under cover of this gesture, opening the hand like this and inserting the fingers into the tip like so. That is just to go like this. Now notice that I don't push the bill over like this or anything like that. The whole per reason for this hand doing its actions is just to get the fingers inside like this. That's your position. Now to open this bill, you don't want to do this, you don't want to do that, you don't want to do any of this, you don't, because that co partially covers over the bill. Here's the solution I found to that. To open the bill, just go like this. See what that does? First of all, I'm keeping this thumb tip covered, but I'm using my first finger of the left hand over the top edge of the bill. I don't have to reach over for the front. I just ride along the edge, the top edge, so that the bill can very openly unfold. So you were here before. Now you just do that, okay? Then it's just a piece of cake to just open the bill the rest of the way. And then as you notice that when I turn the bill over, I always start grab it from the right hand and feed it to the left. By doing so, I can then insert the thumb tip the rest of the way onto the thumb, like so. Always be in the habit of taking it from the hand that has a thumb tip and feeding it into the opposite hand. And then display the hand empty. And that's the technical end, the, slide, the, the, the physical handling of the bill change. Now, before I get into presentational points, are there any questions on just this aspect of it, the technical aspect? I will find out. OK, go ahead and find out, Laura. Any of you Steinsgate fans out there? This is the <laughs> rink of the chosen ones. The rest of us call it Dr. Pepper. Doesn't look like it. Looks like everybody's Everybody with us. Clear. Okay. Now. now, I guess I can start on presentational points for this? Yes, go ahead. Okay, you know what? Just to. I feel kind of method over here, so I just want to bring myself back to where I was with a $50 bill. So, boom, somebody made a, asked a question? No, that was just uh, Nick saying no questions here. Thanks for breaking it down. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, everybody is able to follow along so far, so good. All right, now presentational points. Now, you don't just take the bill and just start folding and then changing it and then, you know, my point about the patter, the selection of words, is to have the patter contribute to the effect. Here is a counter example of what I mean. 
I have a $50 bill. I'm going to fold it in half this way, and then I'm going to fold it in half downwards, and I'm going to fold it in half this You see, You see what I mean? That pattern doesn't exactly contribute to the effect because that pattern describes actions that the audience can already see. So the wording doesn't yeah. contribute just for the fact of have just for the just for the purpose of having a voice heard as the actions take place. You might as well just do it silently, play some Beethoven or some Nine Inch Nails or whatever, and then just go, you know. So if the patter doesn't contribute to the effect, then shut up. Play it to music or do it silently. But if you're going to have patter, have the patter contribute to the effect. Now, now what do you mean exactly by contribute to the effect? By contributing to the effect, the pattern has to say something other than what the audience can already see. That counterexample I said, I have a $50 bill, here's the front, here's the back, I'm going to fold it in half once, I'm going to fold it in half again the other direction. You know, you know, again, those are actions that the audience can already see, so that they, they don't need to be described. So if you're going to say something, say something else. Okay? So... That's the whole point. Say something else. If you're going to say something, say something other than what the audience can already interpret by sight. Okay. And in the case of this routine, I say, now I'm going to show you some sleight of hand, okay? And also, the pattern that I'm about to share, it also motivates the folding, more or less, okay? So anyway, I say, here's some sleight of hand, okay? And there it is. Gosh, you look less than impressed. You see, you, you yeah. see your dialogue there. You know, your 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 inner dialogue is that you're folding a bill in half, and you're you expect it to be mean something. And of course, when you do that, naturally, a viewing audience will be like, "Okay, he just made a big deal about folding a bill in half." You create that scenario with the with with the minds of the audience, and then you react to that. You know, you say you're gonna show a sleight of hand. And then fold it in half. And, ew, no, no, that, that wasn't. You're going to show sleight of hand, and there it is. And then you just rest. You know, slightini. Alive, then, you know, tension, relaxation. I'm going to fold the bill in half. I don't know. I'm going to show you sleight of hand. And there it is. And then the audience would be like, okay, he just folded the bill. And then you react to that. You say, you look less than impressed. Okay, I'm going to show you some more sleight of hand, which motivates the second fold. And there it is. And again, the same, the audience, same reaction. You just fold it in half again. And then you react to that. You say, gosh, you look underwhelmed. And then that becomes the motivation for the rest of the pattern about sleight of hand. How you say, now that's the nature of sleight of hand. You see, sleight of hand takes on the appearance of very innocent, innocuous actions, such as folding a bill. But beneath that innocent guise lies some ulterior motives, some hidden designs that yield a very different result. So you see how that pattern, it doesn't describe what the audience can already see. It describes a concept to the audience that they can't they can't get without you explaining it to them. This whole notion about sleight of hand, how it looks like simple, innocent, innocuous actions, but beneath that innocent guise lie some ulterior motives, some hidden designs that yield a different result. So that's a kind of conceptual presentation that I use for the first change. And because the patter is kind of philosophical in nature, which you know, contributes to the performance, and then they can see what's going on here, because they can see that the bill is folding small and then unfolding and it becomes a different bill. They can see that, so there's nothing to be explained about that. So then when you talk, you might as well talk about something else. So by talking about sleight of hand, how it looks innocent, and now it has ulterior motives, the pattern contributes to the performance, okay? And that's the, the presentational style for the first performance, a, a conceptual performance. Questions on that so far? Uh, let me see. Mm -hmm. Terry Ray says, erased from existence. Erased. Okay, no. Let me, 
Wait, that was the wrong thread. I was going to say, it doesn't exactly relate to, well, Hello. if you want to be that serious, <laughs> the 50 turning into a 1, then the 50 was erased from existence. I guess you want to be that method about it. Okay. You know. <laughs> there we go. Wait a minute. Oops. I passed you up again. Uh, let me check my... I lost, I lost the thread. Oh, you lost the thread. There it is. Nope. Okay, James Snyder said that was great. Any questions? Any questions so far? Looks good to me. All right, so far so good. Let's uh, move on, shall we? Now, you are going to have to change this bill back to its original condition. But you don't want to bore the audience by subjecting them to seeing the same actions over again. So what do you do? You change the performance. So the performance, which started off as a conceptual philosophical performance, now shifts gears into a performance to sell the effect itself. Okay? So now you're really selling the effect, and you're talking about what's going on directly. You say, say to the audience, okay, now notice that as I fold this bill, no matter how small it gets, you are always able to see the bill, okay? Again, that's pattern that contributes to the effect, okay? By saying, okay, no matter how small this bill gets, you're always able to see it. It's never covered from your eyes, okay? So you're selling a point that an audience might not get by just watching, okay? And then when you unfold the bill, you say, another thing to notice about this effect is that as I fold and unfold this, there is no quickness of the hands, no so-called hands being quicker than the eye. Everything is done slowly. Okay? So that, that's a style of patter that directly relates to the effect. You describe the circumstances about the effect to sell it even further. Okay? So even though you're repeating the same effect of a build change, the fact that you've changed gears with the performance, at least it keeps people's interest even on a subliminal level, okay? So, again, first performance was philosophical. The second one is more to, uh, to sell the effect itself. And that's uh, basically the bill change. And before I get into another bill change technique, uh, this is for some of you knuckle-busting enthusiasts who really want to go for a challenge element. Any questions on this so far? I think we're good. Let's see. Nick says, very insightful. Many performers could benefit from such advice, even especially for a basic effect. Ah, see? So, if you're going to talk, let the pattern, again, contribute to the effect. All right? Either to sell the effect itself, to describe the conditions about it, or to do something like what I call a conceptual performance, a conceptual uh, presentation. Or you could do like a personal story, something where the pattern contributes to the effect. Okay, now here, for you knuckle busters out there, as a matter of fact, you know what? Let me just let me just change it from a 50 back to a one. So be like so. Now here is how I used to change the one back into a 50. I call this the four finger change. Okay. Now, I call this a four-finger change because by using only these two fingers of either hand, we have a four-finger technique. Ha ha, ha ha. No, but seriously, because of the fact that I'm only using these two fingers of either hand, it becomes difficult to even hold the bill, let alone hide anything. Okay? And check it out. Yeah. There is my four-finger change, which I seldom use nowadays, uh, oddly enough. Questions on that? I am going to explain it, by the way, but I'm just saying any questions so far because I don't want to just explain talk, 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 talk for too long, and then people would be like, okay, when does he shut up so that I can ask questions? <laughs> so, far? so far, so good. Okay. All right. The way that four-finger change works, and this is more involved than a standard bill change, I am warning you for now, but this is just for some of you people who want something extra to practice with because 
what this change does allows you to do is you can do a standard change from the beginning, but then do a four finger change afterwards to create even more of a challenge element to treat the audience with. Now, this is the reason why I use a rubber thumb tip. See that? The reason why you use a rubber thumb tip as opposed to your standard plastic stiff thumb tips is because a rubber thumb tip allows you to fold the entire thumb tip and curl it around your finger thusly. Everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. So, because of the fact that I explained the basic change, this four-finger change, which you're about to see, is an, is an extension of it. Okay? So, it starts the same. You have to disengage the thumb tip halfway off the bill, and, you're, and the guidelines is that you're only using these two fingers, but really you are going to use some other fingers, but you're cheap. Of course, but you're cheap. Anyway, you fold the bill in half, and this becomes a lot easier after you've done one change to begin with, because then the bill is pre-creased, the folds become considerably easier to do for this particular change. Now, fold it in half, fold it in half. Now here's the deal. As you fold it in half, you want to steal the thumb tip, but because you've only got this premise of these two fingers, stealing it, uh, you know, you're not exactly going to hide a thumb tip like that. Having said that, what you're going to do is you're going to cheat a little bit. You're going to have the second finger, well, all these fingers are curled, but the second finger will, will be right next to the first finger like this. So these two fingers flush next to each other. This section here, it, it creates a wall right there. So that as the first finger pushes over the bill, you see that? There's a wall right there. And behind said wall, you can feel the thumb tip behind it like so. You see that? Right there. I've just stolen it behind these two fingers. And then I can just push it in and look, curled right there. So I have this really, really, really open up appearance like so. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da. Like so. That's as open as it can possibly get. Now this really, the magicians really go nuts over this if you, if you were to practice. Now, to put the bill back into it, obviously you have to uh, straighten this thing out. And again, you want to get this kind of wall action going. And then you want to, again, push the thumb tip, uh, push the bill halfway into the thumb tip, go like this. And you want to create this wall. Now, unfolding the bill is going to be, be a challenge at this point because you got this bill here. You have to maintain this premise of using just four fingers. So what do you do to unfold the bill from this position? It is actually simple. You twist your right, no, your left wrist 90 degrees to your right, like so. By doing so, you do this. And then all you have to do is just create a curl of your second finger, like so. And by creating that curl, check it out. That curl creates cover for the thumb tip. So first, just you're, thumb tip. you're going like mm -hmm. this. And your whole, premise, awesome. your whole premise for turning over the wrist is because this finger is now free to ride over the edge of the bill. And by riding over the edge of the bill, once that bill clears, it covers the thumb tip. And once again, you are in this position to just unfold and unfold. Okay? So for you knuckle busters out there, if you want to go to the extra trouble of doing this four-finger thumb tip bill change as a, as a secondary change, you are more than welcome to do it. And the the advantage of that is that by doing it this way, at least by even though you're repeating the effect to change the bill from a one back to a, a hundred, you're creating an extra impossibility. Okay? That extra impossibility, uh, it's, a, it's an extra treat for the audience. So even though they have to see the same change that happened again, the fact that it looks even more impossible than the first time, it makes seeing it again that much more worthwhile. Okay? So that's an option for you guys. So that is my work on thumb tip bill changes. Any questions on that? Doesn't look like it. Okay, it looks like everybody is clear, huh? Everybody is clear. Okay, so uh, will they be posting questions in the uh, Facebook page or what? Yes. Okay. They'll post the questions, and then I'll ask you the questions. Okay. 
Oh, I see here somebody said something about, oh, time to pull up my mismade bill. That would be... Yeah, that was Ray. <laughs> hey, Ray. How you doing? Now, uh, since you brought up the subject, mismade bill, um, I'd like to show you a few thoughts about that because I used to perform the mismade bill. Okay? First of all, this has been my experience, and I don't know why it happens. Mismade bills, especially when you do an effect like this with it, do get worn over time, okay? So either stock up on mismade bills so that when one starts to show wear and tear, at least you've got a fresh one to use afterwards, or just borrow really worn bills for the effect. Furthermore, when you perform the mismade bill, the biggest weakness of the mismade bill is the fact that the serial numbers of the bills do not match. The serial number of the bill that you borrow will not match the serial number of the mismade bill. Biggest Achilles heel of the effect. So what you do around that, you apply misdirection. Okay? And the misdirection is a psychological misdirection. You sell the audience on the idea that, the, that because it's a mismade bill, you sell them that there's no cuts on the bill. There's no scotch tape. There's no adhesives of any kind. So when you draw attention to the condition of the bill, you therefore subtly draw attention away from the fact that the serial numbers do not match. Okay? So those are some thoughts on mismade bill. So Ray, if you want to go for mismade bill, those are some thoughts for you on that, okay? I don't want to leave you out on that issue. Okay. Oh yeah, one final thought. As far as the um, the transportation of the bill with the with the thumb tip, I have a preference towards squeezed purses. Okay, you may have seen these squeeze purse. I like these. I store quite a bit of my close-up stuff in here: coins, rubber bands, and so on and so forth. This very very easily goes like this. And also, when I, I'm about to start the effect, I could fish for the thumb tip in my pocket. I can go that route. But for convenience's sake, I could say, you know what, let me just um, look for some paper money in here. And then, oh, you know what, instead of my own paper money, could I borrow some paper money, like a $100 bill? So you see what I just did? As I'm talking, I actually load the thumb tip inside the squeeze purse onto my thumb, like so. So that just makes the effect a little more... Uh, a little more economical by way of handling, okay? So your thumb tip with the bill is in a squeeze purse, and the squeeze purse itself can fit very comfortably in the pocket. Okay? Yes. Following you so far. Okay, so far so good. You're following me, and you're still awake. That's good. Yes, and we've just had some more people come, so... Oh, really? Yes. Okay. I, I can catch up. <laughs> I spent a great deal of time on cards and uh, and some coin effects and all that, and here I'm going into an absurd amount of detail with the uh, <laughs> bill change. But uh, see, bill change. Um, modesty aside, I said it before. A bill change, thumb to bill change is common, but what is not necessarily common is the ability to do it, you know, well. So that's why I wanted to share those details with you, so that hopefully you guys. FCM and the holdout could be inspired to do your own thumb tip bill change and do it well and make you know a real highlight of close up piece. And I can tell you from years and years of doing this, it is a centerpiece of my own close up sound. Okay? You made some really good points on presentation. It I mean I did. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so in terms of presentation I, I talked about it a little bit before, this whole notion of uh, conceptual presentation. What I do for my effects is I don't think of this as a thumb tip bill change. I think of this as sleight of hand, the concept of sleight of hand. So it's not so much that I'm presenting an effect, I'm presenting a concept to the audience. I'm presenting the concept of sleight of hand, how it looks innocent, but it has ulterior motives, so on and so forth. Okay? So verbally I'm presenting a concept, physically I'm doing a bill change. So that's something to think about when you're doing your magic. I'm going to go through maybe one or two other examples. Uh, 
in some of my work, in quite a bit of my work actually, I sort of, when I construct a presentation, I actually play a game of word association. I look in effect and I don't just think, okay, ambitious card. I think, okay, what kind of concept can I tack onto that effect? And again, attach onto it. Like when I do my Omnideck act, I do a short uh, ambitious card, and my pattern is, uh, I sort of riff off the standard magician's pattern where I say, okay, it's, a, it's I start with the card in the middle, snap the fingers, brings it to the top. But I actually set it up, I say, I snap of the finger summons the card to the top. And if I take the same card place on the bottom of there, a snap of the finger summons the card to the top. You see, it works just like a subpoena. <laughs> and the lawyers in the audience will crack up at that one. So, mm -hmm. um, so I take the existing pattern, you know, where, you know, place in the middle, snap of the fingers brings it to the top. But then I'm like, you know what? Just play off of that. Okay. As long as the snap of the fingers brings it to the top, what else can you say about it? And I figured, okay, let the playful mind go, go to work. I say, oh, why don't you just summon it to the top? Okay, so yeah, magician's left and right says, you know, snap of the fingers, the card comes to the top or it, it arrives to the top. I say, in my mind, I say, I'm going to say that it summons to the top. A snap of the fingers summons the card to the top. It sounds more elegant that way. And then I'm thinking, hey, as long as I'm saying summoning, that's like lawyer speech. I might as well throw in the line about subpoenas. Okay. It's cute. Yeah. So it's a cute moment, you know. So for anybody doing ambitious card, those are some little uh, tidbits for you guys there. Questions, comments? Also, I take a my sister. Nick said he's watching intently for the very reason that his changes need work. And then he also said that you've made some excellent points. Ah, hey Nick, how you doing? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's so cute with the with the with the bracket and the the lines. It looks like an arrow. Nick watching. Oh, very good. <laughs> Peek there, Nick. I like it. Okay. <laughs> well, this uh, this recording is gonna end up somewhere, right? For people to play back later. It's gonna stay on the Google Plus channel, and it'll stay here in the holdout. All right. It'll also be available on YouTube, but. Um, I think I'm not sure. I have to ask Edward if we take it. Make I think we make it private on the YouTube because it's uh, because of the method methodology. Methodology. There's a tongue twister for you right there. Let me, grab, let me grab my tongue. Yes. But uh, I know it'll stay here in the holdout for hey. people in the holdout to see for a little while. Mm. Yeah, because uh, with build changes, I kind of like, um, wait, I'm anything but cute, but hey, I'll take it. Ah, yes. Ah, suddenly I'm a judge. Thank you, Nick. Oh, okay, I guess I will rise. All right, okay. Now, um, can I go on to another piece? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, because of my limitations with angles, I'm going to have to stand just a little bit. I want to make sure everything is still more or less in view, okay? Okay. Now, um, I've never actually shared this on any forum other than, say, one-on-one -on -one instruction. But what I'd like to share with you now, but before I t tell you about what I'm about to share, uh, has any of you guys ever heard of a concept called alchemy? Yes. Yes, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Some of you have, at least have heard about a subject called alchemy. Well, alchemy, what do you, well, Laura, what do you know about this, the concept of alchemy? Alchemy is mixing different metals together, isn't it? Well, that's part of it. Well, that's a lot more akin to metallurgy, but uh, that's still good. Yeah, it's still good. Alchemy is the idea of taking a base metal. You're going to have to suspend disbelief. This is a 1964 JFK silver half dollar, and I have three more just like it. So even though we're dealing with silver, let's suspend disbelief for the moment and say that it's just a base metal, okay? Now, the idea about alchemy is that you, the idea is that you take a base metal and transmute it to gold, okay? I don't know if you can see that as, uh, with the camera, but basically that is the same president, same year. It is merely a gold version of itself, okay? Now, the idea of alchemy is that, well, the concept of making gold appear it's not exclusive to alchemy. As a matter of fact, 
you might have heard the fable of the goose that laid golden eggs. Like so. You might have even heard the legend of King Midas, who whenever he touched something, it became gold. But alchemy, like any science, obeys certain rules, okay? Certain rules. Like the, the law of equivalent exchange, which states that humankind cannot gain anything without first giving something in return. To obtain something of equal value must first be lost. And that is alchemy's first law of equivalent exchange. Now, I mention equivalent exchange for a reason, because we had those base metal coins before, and they became gold. Did we have anything to start the transmutation with that was gold to begin with? No. We had nothing of equal value to begin the transmutation with that was equal in value to the gold. So therefore, it stands to reason that we can't have gold at the end. We didn't have anything of equal value to start with. Therefore, everything just, the transmutation breaks down, and we're left with our base metal coins that we started with. Questions? Comments? That was great. <laughs> oh, you like that? That's good. Oh, and I like that. that. I love that pattern. I love that story. Uh, okay. The reason I bring this up is because, well, several reasons. Um, we all hear about when we're learning magic, how we have to put ourselves into magic. Oh, that's kind of vague speech, isn't it? How do you put yourself into your work? How do you put your interests into your work? Well, this is, I'm not going to give you a general rule as to how to do that because it's such a really amorphous question that everybody has to find their own answer to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer you my answer as to how I develop my style, my routines, and how I develop a piece like this. See, of my many interests in life, uh, I love anime, I love manga, Christopher Nolan movies, Gary Newman music, among many other things. Okay, But uh, anime, I, I was watching an anime called Full Metal Alchemist. If any of you anime manga fans would have, you know, you, you've heard about that, you know, Edward Elric and whatnot. Now, they actually talk about this concept of equivalent exchange. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the English dub of the first season anime the, the opening pattern is what I just recited. Humankind cannot gain anything without first giving something in return. To obtain something of equal value must first be lost. That is alchemy's first rule of equivalent exchange. So I figured, you know what, that's a cool fact. That was one seed. And this routine is essentially a wild coin routine, and other versions of it, you change the coin into a uh, copper English penny or a Chinese coin with a hole in the center. I figured, you know what, as long as you're going to change a coin, like a spellbound type effect, as long as you're going to change a coin from one into another, why not change the coin into a gold coin? That becomes really compelling, okay? You know, as long as you're going to change a coin, change it into a gold version of itself. I figured, okay, that's, a, that's very, very interesting. It's like, it's at the, it has a really kind of, um, you know, very, really primal interest among people. It, it, it stimulates the greed element, very much like changing a one into a hundred or ones into hundreds like uh, Hundy 500 or Heine 500 or Miser's Dream where you keep making money up here. So the fact that you're making gold up here out of you know simple base elements, it, it, it appeals to that very base greed element. So that there's the appeal right there, you know, this whole notion of alchemy. And that's why alchemy is popular in the first place. You know, you're making things and turning into gold. So I figured as long as you're I'm turning a coin into gold, why not just do more than one coin? And as long as I'm doing that, hey, why not bring up this this whole thing about uh, you know from Full Metal Alchemist, the equivalent exchange pattern. So that sort of brings it all together. And also I threw in little other anecdotes about the, you know, the goose that laid golden, golden eggs and you know, King Midas. So it's to sort of round it out. Okay. So those are some presentational points. Now, uh, any questions on that so far um, about the process before I get into the, the handling? No, we were just making sure everybody knew what anime was. Yes, Ray, it's Japanese cartoons. Well. Us serious anime folks frown upon the use of the word cartoon to be associated with anime. You can call it anime <laughs> animation, but please don't call it cartoons. You make us very upset that way. <laughs> but he got he gets the general concept. That's the important part. Okay. Mm. Anime is Japanese animation. Manga is Japanese comics. Okay. 
Full Metal Alchemist started as a manga. It became two anime series. But anyway, who cares? Now, look it up. It's uh, <laughs> if you if you want to go that route and watch Full Metal Alchemist for inspiration, mm-hmm. I dare any of you guys to do uh, routines relating to philosopher's stones or homunculi. Okay, I dare any of you guys to come up with that and and show me what you come up with. Okay. Anyway, on to the handling. In this case, we have, well, in my case, I have four silver 1964 JFK half dollars, a matching gold-plated coin to round that out with. Go to any coin store, you'll get it. This one's starting to show some wear and tear, but uh, hopefully the uh, the camera can see. You can see that that's gold, yeah. What I do is I net put the uh, gold coin on top of all this. I put it into a purse, thusly. Ah! Pardon me. One second. Okay, that's just okay. There's one. There's one there. I don't know why I pinched that one so hard. Okay, pardon me. Pardon me. That was not supposed to happen. Ah, there it is. Okay, so four coins, gold coin at the face, all inside a purse. The only other thing you will need is a table, some kind of, and some kind of empty cup. Okay. It has to be opaque, obviously, because you can't have a glass because, you know, you don't want people to see through it. Unless you're like Jason Latimer and you can do, like, you know, really cool. Anyway. Anyway. So, here we have the setup. Now, again, I want to, I had to construct pattern that contributes to the effect. And I had to construct patterns that is such that it doesn't describe what the audience can already see. That and I don't want to draw too much attention to what's going on with the props anyway, because what I'm about to do is I'm about to open this purse. I'm about to steal the gold coin, palm it, and bring out these four coins all in one breath, all in fluid motion, without drawing attention to it. Okay? How does that happen? Well, first you have your coins with the uh, gold coin at the face. As you pinch everything, these two fingers under cover of this flap here simply steals the gold coin and then sneaks it into palm. And you have the cover because the, 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 the flap of the purse itself gives you that cover. Okay? So the exposed view, it's a, it, more or less, it's right, I don't know, that's not that exposed. Uh, well, you get the idea. Right here, fingertip rest. Then you, then you just push that into the classic palm, which is quite easy to do once you welded these two fingers around the other coins. Okay? So, the gold coin is now in classic palm. That's why I have the coins in this setup, so that I can start hands-free. And I don't say, look, my hands are empty. I just, I just gesture, okay? Now, also about the presentation. I don't say, I'm going to talk about alchemy right now. It's like, okay, you're sort of force-feeding the concept to the audience. You don't want to do that. I structure my pattern such that even on a slight level, it invites an element of participation for the audience. So instead of saying, I'm going to show you something that involves alchemy, I'm, I say, remember what I said in the beginning? I said, Laura, do you know anything about alchemy? You see, it's like, it's like you're starting a conversation, and, and in that tone, it not only gets the audience to relax, it also invites them to participate in the conversation. You say, yeah, I know about alchemy. Yeah, it's like... Laurie made that interesting comment about you know mixing metals together, and then I and then I respond to that. I say, oh, so that's yeah, that's actually more in common with metallurgy, but yeah, close enough. So we have a very short conversation that draws the audience in further. But instead of just say you know force feeding the pattern, you slightly rephrase it, and all of a sudden it's a conversation. Okay, so you know, you invite the audience in. Okay, so then the pattern I. I and again, these, because of the fact these are silver coins, I instead of avoiding that issue, I address that issue. I say, okay, look, these are silver coins, 1964, you know, the one year they came out in silver. But let's just suspend this flea for a moment and then and just treat these as base metal coins, okay? So instead of dodging the issue that these are bright silver coins, I address the issue and use it as an excuse to, you know, to suspend this flea, okay? So the setup is here. Now, this is a stand-up type of routine. Well, you can do it sitting down, but I like to stand up. Now, bear in mind, you have a classic Tom Gold coin here. You just drop the coin onto the fingertips here, fingertip, toss it onto this fingertip, 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 fingertip. Now, what I'm employing at this point is called the Caps Subtlety by the late, great Fred Caps. 
plastic palm coin here, you don't see that thing. That's because the ridge of the hand conceals the classic palm coin at this angle. And also, I'm not doing it at this angle where that thing will flash. I'm doing it with my right shoulder pointing to you so that the coin in the right palm stays hidden like so. Okay? And at the crucial moment, I finger palm the silver coin and I drop the gold coin into the hand. Okay, so now there's a gold coin in there. But because I toss it a few times around, then I class it palm, go like this. This action just went unnoticed. They had no idea that a switch took place. And also, I'm not saying I'm tossing the coin from hand to hand and now I snap my fingers and the coin has changed. <clears throat> I instead talk about what I just talked about with alchemy, how it's an ancient science and how it deals with the transmutation of a base metal into gold. See that? So it's not just that I did the moves, but the patter sort of, again, it contributes the meaning to the effect, and the patter takes place at the same time. More on that later. Okay, so you display the gold coin. Now, you don't just rush through the rest of the routine. You, know, you don't just do move, move, move. You just turned a coin into gold. Freeze the moment. Show it like so. Da, 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 da. And you also address that it's the same president, same year, same kind of coin. It's just a gold version of itself. And also, it would be a good idea to, you know, put, put them next to each other like so, to show the contrast. So now what you do is you're going to do kind of a closed shuttle pass to exchange this gold coin for the silver coin in palm. So here the coin is in finger palm. You do a fake toss, and this hand just does a, just fakes the, re the receive. So from here, bop, and then this coin, this hand already has a silver coin here, so you just drop that silver coin into the mug, thusly, okay? They saw a gold coin before. They hear a coin go clink here. By association, that must be a gold coin. Okay? So here's your situation. You got a gold coin in finger, finger, finger palm, like so. You're going to use that to your advantage. Now, at this point in the patter, I figured, you know what? This, this The way this routine looks, the way that series of moves looks, it, 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 it sort of, in a really weird way, reminded me of the goose that laid golden, golden eggs. And I figured, you know what? Let's run with that. So then I reword my pattern. I say, you know, the idea of turning things into gold or making gold appear, it's not exclusive to alchemy. As a matter of fact, there's the legend of the golden goose that laid, the legend of the goose that laid golden eggs. So again, the patter coalesces with the actions. And then, same thing, close shuttle pass, you're ditching an another silver coin in here. And you say, then there's the legend of King Midas. And this is just a standard spellbound, but it just goes so well with this pattern where you say, then there's the legend of King Midas, who, whatever he touched, turned into gold. Okay? So the pattern, again, it justifies the, the actions, or it coalesces with them. And again, close shuttle pass. So now you're going to do a wild coin sequence where you do spellbound change after spellbound change after spellbound change. But instead of just doing change after change after change after change, again, you want to have pattern that contributes to the performance. That's why I shift gears and say, well, alchemy, like any science, it obey certain rules, like the law of equivalent and exchange. So while I'm doing these spellbound changes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, I'm reciting the law of equivalent exchange. Okay? So in performance, it goes like, you know, humankind cannot gain anything without first giving something in return. To obtain something of equal value must first be lost. And that is alchemy's first law of equivalent exchange. Okay? So there's all that. Um... But let me just break down the moves, okay? Now, the moves are as follows. You have the silver coin here. You have the uh, gold coin here. You do a, a spellbound change, which is just, you just, you have the coin here like this. You you have the thumb up, uh, on the back of the other coin. As you cover over this, as if you're going to do a French drop, you let the coin drop, and you put the gold coin in its place. And under cover of the other fingers, looks like that. You know, same move, spell, standard spellbound, what you just did with the, you know, the King Midas bit. Now you flip this up, put this over here. Now you're going to do <coughs> the spell bound. But instead of dropping it into the fingers, now you're going to reach in. The thumb is going to grab that coin and put this finger palm coin in its place. So instead of dropping it and depositing, you're taking it and depositing it. That's the next change. Now you got this coin over here, this gold coin in, finger, in thumb palm. Come, come over. Then this, this coin drops, but now grabs 
the thumb palm coin like so, and then you twist the wrist, blah, 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 blah. So it, it, the move is designed to sort of draw suspicion towards this hand, but then you show the hand is empty. Then you come back, you do another spellbound, and then now at this point you, you, you do another spellbound, but this is a different, slightly different spellbound. You hold the coin in the fingertips like this. This gold coin is now held, clipped rather, between the, sec, the first and second fingers, and the, the, the hand comes over to, to grab the coin and then deposit this coin in its place. This is a change you can almost literally do over and over again, okay? But you only do it once, and you're doing it just for the sake of variety and for the sake of having a gold coin physically in play, okay? It, now you shift gears in the pattern and you say, well, we never had anything of equal value to the gold coin to start this whole thing with, did we? And what I just did was not only did I do one more shuttle pass, I also did uh, a, an equipment move, or, you know, a transfer. Basically, I go like this. I take the coin that was originally in left hand, finger palm. The right hand is palm up. As the hands meet, this coin just drops onto the finger, onto the right fingers, but you know, under cover, like this. And then, in one fluid motion, the right, the left hand just turns over like this. So. Um, it looks like I'm just wiping the hands clean, okay? It's a really good utility move, and it's really good, especially when you sort of do it under your breath, under the radar, and especially when you're talk pattering, you know, along, okay? So then I say, well, you know what? We never had anything of equal value to the goal to start this transportation with, did we? Again, you phrase it as a question, because statements, you know, it's just, it, it, it triggers a passive response, but questions by their design, trigger a response, a participation response. So when you say, we never had anything of equal value to the goal to start with, did we? That's when you invite the people to say, no, really. And that justifies the ending of all the coins being silver, where you say, because we didn't have anything of equal value to start the transmutation with, the transmutation breaks down, and we're left with what we started, with four base metal coins. All right? And in a nutshell, that is my alchemy routine for exclusively for, at this point in time, exclusively for you guys at uh, FCM and the holdouts. That's great. Questions? I'm just going to see my Facebook app. Oh, Ronald says he lives in Japan. Ah, cool. Yeah, he's from Kobe. I think that's Kobe. how he says it. Oh, Oh, oh. <laughs> we're talking about improv. Okay. <laughs> Looks like we're points. good. In point. Ready for the next? Point. Well, what I just want to make one more point about patter. Okay. Now, um, as far as patter is concerned, any of you guys? I'm sure you guys have seen the Terminator, the classic movie from 1984. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Linda Hamilton, okay? There's a reason I bring that movie up, okay? Because you remember that first chase scene where Kyle Reese first rescues Sarah Connor and they're running away from the Terminator and they're in this big car chase? And also that Kyle Reese in said car chase is explaining to Sarah Connor what the heck is going on. It's not a man. It's a machine, a Terminator, Cybernetic Systems Model 101. I bring this up because verbally, Kyle Reese is explaining what's going on. Verbally, he's giving exposition. But physically, what's going on is an action-packed chase scene. Okay? Think about that. Physically, you see action, chasing cars and guns. Verbally, you hear exposition, all this sci-fi stuff about cyborgs from the future. Okay? You got that wonderful juxtaposition of something physically going on, and simultaneously, something verbally, something else verbally is going on. That's more or less the foundation, one of the foundation lines of thoughts for when I construct my routines. You just saw it before where I talk about how the pattern should contribute to the effect. That's what I'm talking about. The pattern should talk about something. The action should be doing something else. So, you know, the, between the two, they sort of contribute to the overall experience. Okay? Okay. Yes, Ronald, it's pronounced Kobe. <laughs> I guess everybody says, are you, yeah, you guys, yes, are we alive, folks? That's what you're saying to them, Laura? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I asked if they were alive out there. Huh. Well, at, at least if I did this. <laughs> not the, sure. I did this Ronald's alive. Trip, then then at least I, I have a reason for to, to be not alive, so to speak. You know. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, wow, we just really burned through a lot of time on all, on just just that. <laughs> it, yeah, we did, but it's great information. Really. Hmm. Yeah. Wanted to I mean, share all that, and I didn't even we, get it. We got part. as much time as you do, brother. Yeah. Well, in the time that we have, please, uh, I invite you guys, I implore you guys to ask any questions you may have in the time that we have together right here, right now. Or I could just keep talking and not shut up and just, <laughs> just either make some, some people like Laura laugh or other people, you know, sufficiently annoyed. I don't know. Uh, patter. Maybe I could talk a little bit about patter. How do you how do you talk? First of all, well, how to talk and how to talk. Well, like there's several different schools of thought and how to talk. Okay, you could go to vocal training classes. You could take theatrical classes. That's very well and good. Do that. Um, I've had very limited uh, experience with uh, the theatrical education end of things, so. I'm more of the uh, self-taught school of thought. That said, one of my many hobbies is to uh, go through dialogue in movies and just sort of like memorize lines, which is kind of what actors do anyway. They memorize lines. Um, but, it, but when you're choosing your source material, it's a good idea to choose source material that appeals to you. Like, I really like verbose, well-spoken, eloquent and kind of sophisticated patter. That said, I saw V for Vendetta. I'm like a real junkie on that movie. And, and Hugo Weaving's dialogue in that, well, yeah, it was written by the Wachowskis. I love that dialogue, and I just memorized so many lines from it, especially the infamous V speech, which I'm not going to uh, subject any of you to here. Um, so when you get in the practice of mimicking lines that, are, that, that have a kind of eloquence to them, unconsciously what you're doing is you're sort of fertilizing your, your unconscious mind to that kind of eloquence, and and before you know it, after a while, your own eloquence may raise one or two notches, and before you know it, hey, you, you, we can't shut up if we want to, <laughs> you know. But uh, those are just some schools of thought about patter, at least my how I approach my style of patter, how I you know, um, how I just come up with my also you know improvising, you know, just basically having the courage to say whatever is on the top of your head and the heck with the consequence. Also being my uh, Nick wanted to know, he said, you mentioned anime and manga earlier. What other inspirations do you bring into your routines? Oh, well, that's the thing. You see, inspiration is such that um, it's never from one source, just like lightning never strikes twice on the same spot. You know, um, yeah, anime and manga, certain titles in particular... Like Steins Gate, Death Note, and several other titles that you know really, really captivated and inspired me. But then, uh, <coughs> I mentioned the Terminator before. Just that one philosophy about uh, the juxtaposition of a verbal exposition of, of the story and the physical action scene. So sometimes it could just be just a line of thought, a line of thinking that can influence my my work as well. So, and also. Patter, not just you know, bringing in pat concepts like alchemy, sleight of hand, and whatnot. Um, uh, yeah, just to reiterate what I said before, basically it's it's kind of like a word association thing. What kind of word, what kind of association can you bring to a routine that you can talk about it? And also, the thing about this alchemy routine, when I've performed it, I've actually had people say, "Hey, could you do that? Th the alchemy thing? You know, they they remember it by the name alchemy. That's just wonderful. You know, that they remember the routine by the title that you gave it." You know, so if you can put that in your routines, great. You know, just come up with a concept and word your presentation around that concept. And when they can remember that concept, cool. You know, so yeah. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, what's called an otaku. You know, I'm oh, like an anime manga. That's uh, one of my uh, part-time vocate. Well, full-time, sorry. And I sort of bring whatever inspiration I have from that into my work. And that's just one way that I. Uh, put my own stamp on my own routines. All right. Any other questions? 
Oh, you love V2, or I, I do too. If you want to be that's my Yeah, Nick said, uh, he said that he was going to go watch V2 as soon as we were done. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a win right there, yep. Say that's a win right there, yeah. All right. Yeah, Nick, okay. oh, yeah, I love that speech too. Uh, I've, I've actually performed that speech once. Uh, I was just improving ad lib. Uh, uh, one of my Coney Island was it, it just happened to be November the 5th that day, and I figured, oh, to heck with it. I'll just recite that speech. You know, I had to introduce it, of course, but, you know, there it was. And uh, let's see. Alive, watching, and listening intently. Thank you, Michael. All right. Uh, anybody else? Okay, let me just refresh. Andy just joined us for a few minutes. Okay. Andy. Let's see here. Okay, who else? Yeah, I mentioned improvising one speech to um, uh, basically say what's on the top of your head and just kind of, just have the courage to just kind of go with it. Just, just go with this stream of consciousness, if you will, because the thing about uh, doing magic is you want to avoid moments where, you're, you're, where you have dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm going to do this alchemy. You see, dead silence. You know, so um, try to avoid uncomfortable silences, which is what uh, Uma Thurman talked about in Pulp Fiction. Don't you hate that? What? Uncomfortable silences. You want to uh, avoid that when possible because, you know, by having an element of discomfort, of uncomfort in a performance, that, that, that sort of taints the performance experience of magic sound, doesn't it? But even if you have it, just address it. It's like, oh, that's an uncomfortable silence there. You know? So, yeah, when you ask the audience a question and there's dead silence, it does get annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you cannot do that speech at that point. Okay, Nick, I accept your challenge. In view, a humble vaudevillian veteran cast vicariously as both victim and villain by the vicissitudes of fate. This visage, no mere veneer of vanity, is a vestige of the Vox Populi now vacant, vanished. However, this valorous visitation of a bygone vexation stands vivified, and has vowed to vanquish these venal and virulent vermin vanguarding vice and vouchsafing the vilely vicious and voracious violation of volition. <laughs> the only verdict is vengeance, a vendetta, held as a votive, not in vain, for the valiant veracity of such shall one day vindicate the vigilant and the virtuous. <laughs> Verily, this vicious swaths of verbiage viewers most verbose, so let me simply add that it's my very good honor to meet you, and you may call me B. How was that, Nick? <laughs> mm. Mm. Actually, there was a time where I would do Rene Lavon's um, Oil and Water, one hand, and I figured we have phrases like abracadabra and um, hocus pocus and the seldom used supercalifragilisticexpialidocious magic phrases. So I figured, you know what, there was this one part of V for v Vendetta where Evie was seeing the mirror and she said, and she was reading V very venversum vivis vc and I'm like, oh heck, that is a cool phrase for magic if there ever was one. V very venversum vivis vc. By the power of truth, I, while living, have conquered the universe. So you say the phrase, and then you translate it from roughly from the Latin, and then that affects the magic. So that that was a concept that I had when I was when I used to do the uh, Rene Levan oil and water. All right, bring a tear to your eye. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Nick. I didn't mean to make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> and you wanted to know if you could do it any faster. Hey, that was just a suggestion, not a challenge. <laughs> well, it's, that's the caffeine from the Dr. Pepper talking at that point. I probably would go faster if I had a Red Bull. All right. Okay, okay. so any other questions while we have all this wonderful time together? Please! No, I'm not begging or anything by the fact that I said please. Yeah, okay, I am begging. All right, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> How long, uh, when did you get started in magic? Um, oh, good. At least you said, when did you get started in magic? Okay, because if you had said, how long have you been doing magic? I would say, okay, the wise guy answer would have been the past hour and a half. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, but the honest, I would have said, the honest answer <laughs> would have been since 1990. Yes, I was real young. I was uh, <clears throat> young back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, also, that joke, uh, wise guy jokes. I figured if you come across too much 
like a wise guy, a wise, you know what I mean? Uh, you might turn one or two people off because who likes a wise guy per se, you know? Having said that, I figured as long as I'm going to use a wise guy line, I might as well address it as such. That's why instead of saying, oh, I've been doing magic for an hour, you know, an hour and a half, instead of saying the direct answer, I say the wise guy answer would be the past hour and a half. So at least you acknowledge the fact that you're acting like a wise guy at that moment. So that creates a more a greater comfort level for anybody that would listen to you so that you defuse any offense that you might cause. So if you're going to be a wise guy, at least be honest and upfront with it. All right? Yes. Michael Schwab has a question. As a two-handed magician, did you have a pattern line to justify the one-handed routine? That's a good, good question. Um, it's been a while since I performed that routine. Uh, either I would just do the routine and sort of let people notice, oh, my God, he just did that with one hand. Or I would just... Uh, there were times where I would, depending on the moment, I'd say, you know, there was this one-handed magician from Argentina that I was really inspired by, so as a tribute, I'd like to do it to him. So either I would bring up the backstory, the honest backstory, you know, because sometimes your own honest backstory becomes interesting pattern in its own right. Who could be more, what could be more honest than that, okay? That said, there were times where I would actually bring up the fact that I was inspired by a one-handed magician from Argentina, or I would just do the routine. Sometimes it's a good idea not to explain we are in the business of creating mysteries. And by definition, a mystery is something that somebody does not know how it's done. Okay? Therefore, by definition, what just happened, that mystery, it has no explanation. So why explain it? So yeah, think about it. So even though I would do a one-hand routine, I didn't draw attention to the fact that I did one hand. I mean, yeah, I could brag about that if I wanted. <coughs> I just did it. And then let the audience notice for themselves, oh, my God, he just did that with one hand. And sometimes it's more powerful that way when, when the audience picks up on details on their own that you want them to pick up on. Okay? It's basically like Socrates' line of thinking. It, 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 he would not so much present statements but ask questions. It's like, okay, did you notice that that was done with just one hand or something? You, you know? So, whenever possible, let this audience draw their own conclusions, the conclusions that you want them to draw, okay? That way you're not force-feeding them every single little detail, but they can, you only explain so much and then let the audience draw their, draw their own conclusions that you want them to draw, you know? <clears throat> Who inspired you to get your start in magic? Well, it was whoever was running the after-school magic club at that time. He did... He took a coin, made it disappear right in front of my eyes, like kind of this close. I was like, whoa, you know. And then at the official meeting, okay, it was called a French drop. And that was actually my official start because when I joined my high school magic club, it dawned on me that, oh, this thing called magic. Now, I'd, I'd seen Copperfield like on TV, like with the Alcatraz special way back. <clears throat> Not that old, but anyway. Um, the idea was that when I saw magic, that it could be done right in front of someone's face, you know, close up, and that it could be, um, uh, that it can be learned, that it can be taught from one person to another, I was like, that's really interesting. So that's basically what gave me my start, okay? And what's this? Um, ooh, we had a magician, and I see Andy, he's, he's, he posted something. Late to the party. Okay, we forgive you. Just this once. I'm not sure what questions have already been asked. If not already asked, I see you also work as a mentalist. That I do. Can you talk for a moment about your inspirations in mentalism and your presentation approach? Psychic, NLP, psychology, favorite effects? Okay, very good question. Uh, it, again, it's like what I explained before about um, um, uh, explaining things. Like, just don't explain. By saying that you do NLP, again, that's like giving an explanation as to the method that you employ. That sort of takes away from the mystery. And also, um, you know, psychic. Yeah, you could do psychic. I mean, NLP, NLP I, I especially have, a, have, have more feelings against. I mean, psychic, that could be one way of going. Um, uh, psychology, what I, what I do, when I do effects, like I do a Q&A act. Um, I also do um, other things like a blank night and 
blindfold routine, I don't say how I'm doing it. I don't say, okay, this is psychic phenomenon, and I don't say, well, actually, you know what? I don't, I, let, me, let me scratch that. I say I'm going to simulate psychic phenomenon, okay? Uh, mm. One of the books that I read. Simulate. That's a good word. Yeah. I picked that up from a book called Simulacra and Simulation by John Bolgerlard. That was one of three books that Keanu Reeves had to read before he read the script to The Matrix. Because the Wachowski brothers at that time <laughs> recommended for Keanu Reeves to read three books. And that was one of them, Simulacra and Simulation. And so the, especially the, uh, the opening sections about the concept of simulation, I was like, you know what, that makes so much sense to simulate something. That concept. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that. Yeah. So... <laughs> So I don't say that I'm presenting psychic phenomena. I say I'm going to simulate psychic phenomena, or I'm going to simulate, you know, spiritual phenomenon. Okay. So that is one of my approaches to doing mentalism. Um, as far as favorite effects, I just listed a few. Uh, NLP. Um, uh, I do a my, my blindfold Q and A. Oh, I do magic squares. Uh, let's see. Um, one or two uh, thumb rider effects. Uh, Let's see, uh, spoon bending routine, very much banner check. Um, so, yeah, PK touch. So, yeah, I I don't say how it's done. I don't say that it's, like, you know, psychic or psychological or NLP or anything like that. I just do the effect because I think it's more mysterious that way. And, Andy, I hope that answers your questions about that. And I see here, Ronald, I'm, I'm just trying to take it from the top down here, Ronald. Qualities or personality should a magician close-up parlor stage have? Okay, you know what? I think the qualities of personality that those magicians should have, I think, I think should be the most honest qualities about a person, provided that those honest qualities uh, can coexist with a general audience. I say with a general audience because, I mean, you could be uh, like the Andrew Dice Clay line of verbal style or George Carlin, you know, far more verbally offensive, provided you're, you're working for that kind of audience, um, which, of course, won't work for, say, a general audience. So it's to be mindful of your audience and to bring, them, bring out the most honest parts about yourself to that audience. So it's kind of, I think of uh, perf performance magic as kind of a compromise, a negotiation between what you bring to the table and what the audience expects. So you have to deliver only so much of yourself to fit that audience. I mean, obviously, there are certain sides of yourself that you would not do in public, but that's basically, it. you know, bring whatever you can of yourself, the most honest, the most, you know, stronger talk of yourself to that audience, okay? Um, so, yeah, I think, cause, you know, I, I say that it has to be honest because um, some people take a more theatrical kind of character to them, that's being honest. That's that's how they honestly perform. This is how I honestly perform. So whatever is most honest about you, I think that's what you should bring to the table. Okay, I hope that answers your question about that, Ronald. And Nick, what is the single most important piece of advice you ever received? Oh, that's a very good question. That's a good question. I don't think I so much have a single piece of advice as I have lots of pieces of advice. Uh, there's bits of wisdom that I picked up here and there. Um, let's see, hmm. let's see, uh, well, one quote from Sucker Punch comes to mind, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, I don't know, that sort of resonated with me, <laughs> um, let's see, uh, well, you know what, Michael Amar actually was very influential in my formative years in magic, and I learned through his essays, this no uh, notion of simplicity of effect, and also, um, try not to take uh, premature credit for an effect because, you know, somebody else would have come up with it beforehand, so, you know, just be mindful about that. And um, also Vernon's theory of artistic advancement, how you don't so much progress linearly from one plateau to another. You don't progress linear in a linear fashion, but you make sudden leaps to a higher plateau. The more you practice, the more experience you garner in, in, in your craft and your art. So... That, that's just something, you know, just, just, a, just a few bits of ideas to keep in mind. So, yeah, not so much advice, because advice is not really coming to mind per se, but um, 
Yeah, because, oh yeah, you know, be natural. I guess that's more or less what Vernon said. So, you know, what I was saying about being honest, that's basically like being natural, okay? Well, I hope that. And you, you also create your own effects, correct? Uh, create. Um, the alchemy piece is more or less my own. Um, lots of borrowed moves and such from other people. Uh, you know, to create an original effect per se, it's, um, again, it's all about the inspiration, okay? I mean, there's a few, like, uh, I have several works in progress, like Stein's Gate uh, is an anime that I was, like, you know, enraptured by when that was airing on TV, and, you know, you can get the English dub on Blu-ray and DVD, but anyway, the, the co one of the many concepts of the, of the show addressed the issue of, um, well, they the brought the idea of a, what's called a D-mail, not an email, but a D-mail, DeLorean mail, if you will, the idea of sending a text message one week into the past, and I figured that would be such a cool effect to do. So I played around with different uh, uh, ideas and approaches for it. I have one approach, um, but it's not literally a um, uh, a, a email uh, a email sent like one week into the past. I mean, that's a, it's kind of a work in progress. I, I just have to mix and match with some because it could get really involved. But uh, some the some of the approaches I've taken are, are are much simpler, and I just played around with the the, the philosophical side of it. So uh, I, some works in progress on that. So. Um, and of course, Death Note. I have some, you know, some works in progress regarding Death Notes. So and you saw the Alchemy routine, and also from a few other, you know, pieces that, uh, you know, a lot of work is in progress. Let's see. Laura, you want me to show you? A f <laughs> yeah. Are you there? We still have you, Robin. And we've lost Robin for a minute. There he is. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Hello, Robin. Can anyone else see Robin? We can see you, but we can't hear you. Come back. Yeah, I can see that, James. Um, can you all see me still? Yes, Robin went bye-bye. Okay, guys, what I'm going to do, since he's not on the line at all, um, looks like the call got disconnected somehow, so give me five seconds, and I'm going to call him back and put up another link. Okay? Everybody got that? Okay, give me... Five seconds. Just hang out there and uh, visit amongst yourselves for a moment. <laughs> I shall be right back.
and we're waiting on Robin to come right back with us. And here it goes. Here's Robin. Okay, there, 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 there is me again. Like Let I, me put this new link okay. up. Which I have. Oh, and now the other one rings. Oh my! Shut up. Mm -hmm. oh. All right. Yeah, I uh, other calls came in for me on my other iPad, so I'm like, okay, that's going to interrupt the flow of things. So you know, and I didn't want people to hear my other conversations, so I had to hang that up. And I didn't know how you know what we we're. So how was all that? That was good. <laughs> Let me. Uh, That's what she's. Is this just you and me, or are we still broadcasting? No, we're broadcasting right now, and I'm about to paste the link up for everybody. They're oh, okay. amongst themselves right now. All right. Okay. There we go. All right, my time unfortunately is a bit limited, but okay. Yes. Most of it. Let's make the most. Well, we of only our have about 15 minutes. Left. Fifteen minutes. Okay, let's make the most of that. Okay, okay. Oh, Rudy really Cody had a cool post. All right. Uh, I'll just follow the thread on the holdout. Yeah. There you go. Ah, right. Okay. He's back. <laughs> wow. <Let's> see. <laughs> Excitement just welled from everywhere. Total agreement on what was that? Bro, claim no powers, but blow them away anyway. Yes, I have to go in out the LA. Thanks, Robin and Laura. No view or sound. Someone tripped over the AV cable. What me? Can you still see me? And Nick says, there you are. Finish. Okay. There I am. Okay. Um, are we broadcasting now again and all that? Yep. We are live and ready to go. What about some card is, uh, some some card explanation? Oh. Okay, let's. Oh wait, you know what? I shouldn't have done that. I should do this. Okay. All right. Um. Okay, because of the angle, the way I have this thing situated, I'm going to have to stand, and as a result, you're going to have to see the cards in the foreground, and unfortunately, my nether regions in the background. If you don't mind about that. <laughs> no. Oh, I, I can't stand performing this way, but, uh, you know, you get the idea. But at least because of the fact that this is all one shot, you know it's me and not somebody else's hands. And, yes, I am one of those people that practices. Okay. Is that good? Or or, or, or maybe you want to see something like this, uh, fans. Or maybe you want to see uh, this and then this and this fan. Or maybe you want to see, you know, look all spread and all that. How about this? How about I go like this, I go like this, I go like this, I go like this. Is everybody watching this? Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, false. I don't know why I keep these things here. These are advertising cards. Uh, these are the cards that everybody else throws away. Except I do this, and I do this, and they become interesting. Moving right along, the warm-up continues. Madcap, zany stuff. Go like this, go like this. Can you see all this? Go like this. Ah! And then let go like this, 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 and then this. Now you know not to play cards with a guy like me, right? Right. <laughs> anyway... Oh, I'm continuing. Yes. Okay. Loud and clear. Yeah. Emphasis on the word loud. Yeah. That's the caffeine talking, Nick. Anyway. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, what are your favorite cards, Bicycle or Phoenix? Bicycle. I, there was a whole thread about that. Bicycle versus uh, whatever brand. Mm. Sorry about that. I'm on a high fiber diet, you understand. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a sickness. My therapist says I'm improving. Interpret that. So harmony. what we were on before was your creative process and how you go about. Uh, yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, to answer that question, you notice that I'm going to explain a little bit about how I do that, making cards appear from the mouth. Yeah, the the idea is to be able to make a card or a group of cards appear really, really thin. And does this look like a, a thin deck of packet of cards? Yes. As a matter of fact, it, it can not only can it become thick again, but it can reach a point 
where it can be as thick or as many or as numerous as I want it to be, okay? As a matter of fact, you only have so many cards right now, but I can make that same amount of cards look like a lot more cards than it actually is. And I'm actually going to keep going, and I'm not going to stop until, Laura, you actually stop me by way of laughter, by way of applause, by way of saying, stop, I've seen enough already, or, oh, cool, Robin, that's so cool. Well, how, how, what's your preferred reaction to all this, by the way? <laughs> I'm just going to let you go on forever. Okay, all right. Oh, you want to be one of those? Okay, fine. All right. <laughs> Stop. I bring that up because there is a creative process to it, if you can believe it. I start with one effect, the cards from mouth, and I'm thinking, you know what, let's just play with that. And uh, playing with Leonard Green's snap deal, and I came across that particular combination thereof. You know, so it that way it becomes like a logical uh, continuation of cards from mouth. So um, start with cards from mouth. Oh, and also. To answer somebody else, I think it was Nick's, somebody else's previous uh, question about advice, um, I, I used to do cards from mouth. I used to do it like this, you know, which is work, which is good. But I went to see an acting coach one time, and he says, you know what? You're making it look like they're coming from your mouth, but make them look like they're coming from your stomach. I figured, okay, let's do that. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> So, by suggesting the right words, make them come out of your stomach. That creates this whole internal dialogue uh, about what you just saw. You know, you know, you know what I mean? Yes. It changes the texture of the effect, and all that 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 change just made such a dramatic difference. And that's a cool piece of. It. And when possible, I try to apply that line of thinking to other other aspects of my work. So, in the case of cards from mouth, I don't think of them as cards from mouth. I think of them as like cards from stomach. So it, it serves a practical form of misdirection, too, because it's not so much, hey, look at the hand that puts the cards on the table. It's more like, see, my, 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 my acting, if you can call it acting, it creates this center of attention. They're looking at all this. They're not looking at the hands and, or the cards, okay? No, they're looking at what they think is about to come out of your mouth. <laughs> now... As far as technique is concerned, I came up with this years ago. Uh, instead of a bottom palm or anything like that, I use a lateral palm, if you will, or a gambler's cup. What you do is you have the deck from above. You use the middle finger here to just grab a, a section of cards, like a, roughly a quarter of the deck, like so, around the middle finger, okay? And you got a lot of shade, and also because of the nature of the lateral palm, there's very, very little visible finger motion to, to, to make the, uh, the move happen. See? Like this. You see? And I'm in position. Okay? So all I'm doing is this. I'm just feeding this front section up into my mouth, and I'm just spraying the cards downwards. So, done to speed, it looks like that. Okay? That's cool. Right? So sometimes creativity doesn't have to mean something as broad as creating an original effect. Sometimes creativity can be applied to the smaller details, like use, like figuring out to use a lateral palm as opposed to a full bottom palm. You know. So I was going to say about creativity, I think creativity also has a lot to do with problem solving. You have a problem that you're trying to resolve. Creativity is how you solve a problem. In the case of uh, cards from mouth, I didn't want to use a straight bottom palm. I wanted to, I had to apply whatever creativity I had to come up with this no, a technique of using a lateral palm instead. Okay. Right. Any, any questions on that? I think we're good. Okay. Well, how about I just do one or two? I've been going on and on about this uh, in some of the threads on FCM, this whole notion of obedient cards. Laura, name a card, please. Nine of clubs. That's correct. No, no, no seriously, seriously. Uh, nine of clubs, did I influence your choice at all? No. So I didn't make you choose that particular card? So no. A number, a small number, what would it be? Two. Two? Really? So that'll be one, and that will be uh, oh wait, not like that. 
have to just rub it over here like this. And so that would be one, and that would be two. Looks like this. Wow. How did you do that? Very quickly, thank you. Now, <laughs> name another one, please. I'm just going to go through a few, breeze through a few of these things. Go ahead, name a card. Three of hearts. Three of hearts. You sure. Uh, and you could have picked three of diamonds. You could have picked three of spades. You could have picked uh, whatever. You, you picked the uh, three of hearts, yes? Yes. Okay, good. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to do is use these jokers for the sake of probability and statistics. And you will notice that with one joker on the bottom, one joker on top, like so, with 100% probability and statistics on my side, your three of hearts, was it? Your three of hearts is between the two jokers. Yes. And I cannot say the same dumb joke like that. Great face. I'm sorry about that. Anyway, <laughs> what I'm going to do is this. Okay. Uh, kind of washed out. No joker on top, no joker on bottom. And if I were to spread through the deck. Oh, goodness gracious me. Look at that. Dave says he struggles with a pass. Any, any good suggestions on an alternate? Diamond Levels Pass, which is what I've been using over and over just now. Okay. Okay, here we go. Now, the whole point about a pass is, of course, it's a cut that, go, that goes invisible, goes under the radar. Um, I don't think Simon would mind if I were to share this with you guys because I use this pass, like, religiously. I'm, like, on autopilot with this move. So I'm going to try to do my best, do my utmost. Cards. Pinky here, top of the deck here. Now, notice the grip with the, the, the hand here. It, it, it's kind of like a biddle grip, sort of. And I create all kinds of shade here with my thumb in the back, the fingers forming a screen at the front. See all that? Yes. The way Simon explained it to me and to other people is you kind of have to think of this as like a duck. You see the duck all kind of all still and graceful on the top of the water, but beneath the water, he's like paddle, all kinds of paddling going on beneath it. That's kind of what's happening over here, because um, if I were to do this, it's kind of awkward to do at this angle, but yeah, I just did the pass just now. As a matter of fact, I'll have to, uh, well, it's kind of washed up, but I don't know. Take my word for it. That's a king of diamonds. And if I were to, again, do the pass right here, oh, take my word for it. That's a seven of diamonds just now. So the technique is that you have top half like so, bottom half like so, uh, the right hand takes the entire thing and just kind of tilts downwards, like 45 degrees downwards, whereas the back half sort of tilts 45 degrees backwards. So I don't know if you can see this. Ah, I'm sort of going like this. So together they become 90 degrees away from each other. That's part of it. And then what happens is the right hand half kind of deposits its half beneath this one. And from the front, you can't really see it because the, the right hand is just providing all kinds of shade for it. Okay? So here, you just deposit it, and then and then after you make the deposit, both hands just come into view like this. So done to speed, and that's the thing. This move does not require speed. It simply requires smooth technique. And the, and the move itself is virtually angle-proof. I mean, you can have people to the extreme right or left, and, and they still won't see it. Okay? I hope that was a good uh, thing with the pass. Yeah, because I used to struggle with the pass myself. I didn't, me personally, I didn't like the idea of doing, you know, the really fast pass. I, I, I prefer to have smooth techniques. So that's why I use, you know, Simon Lovell's pass, like, religiously. I love this move. And in the case of name a card type stuff, uh, I asked, Laura, could you, could you just name any other card, please? Any card? Um, ten of clubs. Ten of clubs, okay. Now that card is somewhere in the middle of the deck, and I just passed it just now, and there it is at the bottom of the deck. Wow. Ah. Okay, do that again. Okay. Let that, me name a different card. That, that was partly like... Name another one. Two, two of diamonds. Two of diamonds. That's correct, Laura. Now, uh, you'll notice that it is not on top. I lied. <laughs> That's excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what happens when you use a memorized deck. 
Okay. Ah. I know exactly where every card is. And the whole uh, premise behind uh, locating cards is I use what's called an estimation cut, which takes the form of a pass. So in the case of the, the Ten of Clubs, in this stack, it's card number 24 from the top. So I just cut, I just estimate cut somewhere in the middle, okay? And then I gesture up like this, okay? By gesturing up like this, I'm looking at the bottom card, Six of Hearts. That's card number 23, and the Ten of Clubs is card number 24. That means this Ten of Clubs is on top. You see, the, the, the science behind locating cards in a memorized stack is you want to do some kind of estimation cut, then a, and then a peak to determine how far away you are from the card and, 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 for, and which position. Okay? So we're going back to the, in this case, the two of diamonds. Okay? That's card number 19 in the stack. Okay? Again, I just did my pass. That's my estimation cut. I just did my peak by looking at the bottom card, king of clubs. And right now, the two of diamonds is now on top. Okay? Yep. So that's just me being, ooh, lucky. But what if I wasn't so lucky? What if I was say, four cards away. I'm still looking for the Ten of Diamonds, but now instead of being on top, it's like fourth on the top because, look, here's the bottom card. That's num number 15, Six of Spades, and the Two of Diamonds is number 19. So that 19 minus 15, that's a difference of four. So then I'm like, okay, you know about casino dice, yes, Laura? Yes. Roll a casino dice in your mind. Roll one die in your mind. Okay? Uh-huh. And just let it land on a number. Now what if I said five? What if you said five? That's no problem. I just spell five. F I B E. And there it is. Oh, because that's four. Yeah. yeah. I understand. Perfect. And if I would have said three, then you would have counted three. One, two, three. Yeah, you or if I would have said just work with the situation. Six. Now you don't spell out the fact that a a die has six sides and therefore only six possibilities. You simply say, roll a casino die in your mind and just let it land on a number. What number did it land on? So depending on what lands, either you count the number or you spell the word. And you let the audience subliminally believe that that is the end, end, intended result. So, I, so they could have either counted this, this many numbers or they could have spelled that many letters, you know, depending. Let right. Them, right. Okay. Classic bird. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes. I saw what you it's did there. A bit like a is, is there any specific memorized deck you use, like a BCS system or Mnemonica. something along that line? Mnemonica. Mnemonica? Yes, Mnemonica. I'm like addicted to that one stack. I love Mnemonica uh, for, for many, many, many reasons. One of the biggest reasons is because, well, it looks like a random order, okay? Four of clubs, two of hearts, seven of diamonds, three of clubs, four of hearts, six of diamonds, ace of spades, five of hearts, nine of spades, two of spades, queen of hearts, three of diamonds, queen of clubs, uh, eight, eight of hearts, six of spades, five of spades, uh, king of clubs, two, uh, yep. Oh, king of clubs, that's next. Nine of hearts, king of clubs. Well, you get the idea. I don't want to go through the entire deck because, you know, I don't want... I want you guys to go out there and get the book, the book, Mnemonica by Juan Tamariz, and also the new DVD set. Yes, I'm plugging stuff. Mnemonica Miracles. It's a five DVD set. Okay. Cool. Back. That's M N, right? Mnemonica. Yeah. Yep. M N. Mnemonica. Okay. So yeah. Yes, like I said, Michael. Yeah, it is a bit like a turnover pass without the turnover. Yes. So. Uh, how how many times can you shuffle that deck before it goes out of order? Well, it depends on the shuffle. Now, Juan Tom I mean, goes into detail about what kind of shuffles you can right. do and how to reset the stack with it. Whether it's an overhand shuffle, riffle shuffle, or combination thereof, he goes into details with all that. Uh, me, me personally, I just shuffle the holy heck out of this deck. Like that. And mm -hmm. it's four of clubs, still four in hearts, order? Clubs, four of hearts, seven diamonds, six of spades, five of hearts, nine of spades, two of spades. Yes, still in order. Want to see that again? Okay, sure. Since you asked so much. Yeah. Oh. Done. So that was a false shuffle. Yes, it was. Oh, for Pete's sake, let me just spell it out for you. Nah, ma. 
Nika. I spelled it correctly, didn't I? No, you just put new moon It's like it almost looks oh, like... Oh, there's an O. It's supposed to be an O there. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want you to yeah. do anything there. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, 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 oh. Did somebody say something about... Oh, Great Day Conjuring? Okay, that's a separate post. Okay. No worries. And what else? We still have some time together, so let's uh, make some use of it. Yeah, that was a false shuffle. Leonard Green's Real Green Shuffle. I love that shuffle. There are a lot of good shuffles out there. A lot of really good shuffles out there. If you can do, you know, like the Heisenstein Shuffle by my friend Carl Hein or uh, the uh, Truffle Shuffle, you know, those are all great shuffles. My my favorite is Leonard Green's Real Green Shuffle. I love that shuffle. I've been using it for years and years. <clears throat> oh, and also... What's a good uh, impromptu effect to do when somebody just comes up to you, you know, other than pick a card, you know, when somebody comes up to you and, and says, do something, you know, oh. just out of the blue? All right, do, this you, is do you automatically do. go to, like, an ambitious card, or...? Heck, no. Well, I save, I save my ambitious card segment for my Omni deck routine. But... The sequence that I do when I'm just called upon to do something, um, it could be any number of things. Like uh, if I were to do a classic force, I turn it into a kind of quasi psychic uh, performance. Uh, but uh, if, but here is my utility piece here. Okay, now Laura, do you know anything about something called feng shui? Yes. That's good. Now pretend you're extending your hand out to here. Okay. Pretend that this is your hand over here, okay? Because this is kind of an in-person thing. I say to you, that's good that you know about feng shui because feng shui, pretend that this is on your hand. Feng shui is an ancient Chinese philosophy that deals with balance and harmony. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, no, 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 seriously. seriously. So basically, I just did a shuffle in your hand. I say, okay, okay. Laura, uh, you're familiar with the deck of cards, right? Yes. And you know the four suits? Yes. Well, I want you to think of your favorite suit, the one you love, okay? And see the color bright and colorful in your red. Can you do that for me? Yes. Okay, now, Laura, using that suit, I want you to think of a card. Not like an ace or a high card, but a really odd one that I can never guess. Can you do that for me, Laura? Yes. Okay, think of it, think of it, think of it. Now, Laura, you wouldn't by chance be thinking of the three of hearts, would you? No. Thought not. But you notice that the deck has been in your virtual hand the entire time. Okay? Yes. So Laura, for the first time, name the card you were thinking of. Three of clubs. The three of clubs. You sure? Yes. Positive. Yes. Funny. Clubs. It's funny because if we were to spell three and deal a card for each number, one, two, three, Look at what we arrived at after the fact. Now, this is a deck that's been in your hand the whole time. There it is, three of clubs. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> that is the combination of different things that I learned from Juan Tamariz, David Berglis, uh, Batashek's psychological subtleties, and so on and so forth. That's one of my go-to effects if I am called to do something with cards. I call that my alpha routine. I also, have, correspondingly, have a beta routine, a gamma routine, and a delta routine. Now I can. Uh, you notice okay. the first part of it was a psychological force. Yes. That is word for word Jonathan Grant's uh, psychological force. I hope he gives information to uh, Right out of psychological subtleties, but I added a few gestures to it. When I said to you, I want you to think of your favorite suit, the one you love. Notice what I just did? Oh, yeah. I didn't see that when you first said it. Yeah, see that? I arrange my hands in the position of a heart, okay? But I make it as kind of an under-the-breath type of gesture. I say, I want you to think of your favorite suit, the one you love. Now, also, to introduce this uh, force, I don't so much say, um, I'm going to do telepathy or whatever. I just, and also, I don't ex uh, expect you to know the suits right out the gate. I have to prime you first. I have to gauge you. I say, are you familiar with a deck of cards? Now, I actually do get people who say, no, I don't really know a deck of cards. And then I have to spell out, you know, that there are 13 numbers, four suits, whatever. And then I also ask, are you familiar with the four suits? Again, I have to gauge you, okay? 
Because if you don't know the four suits, then I can explain, okay, there's clubs, there's hearts, there's spades, there's diamonds. See that? So by questioning you, that sets up the, the, the force. So it makes things flow easier. And if you already know, great, I can just skip all the uh, prep. So then I say, I want you to think of your favorite suit, the one you love. See the color bright and colorful in your head. Notice I said in your red, like the color uh -huh. of your hair. And also before I said the one you love, love, art, get it? Mm-hmm. Testing hearts right, all the way. So I said the one you love in time with this gesture, the one you love. See the color bright and colorful in your red. Do you have it? Then I say, then I have to force the number. Now using that suit, I want you to think of a card. Not like an ace or a high card. That's a kind of an NLP type thing. Not like an ace or a high card. Notice I sort of squint my eyes and I just shake my head no to, to eliminate the high cards. And then I say, but a really odd one. I open my eyes. I'm like all eager and excited. But a really odd one. And then I say that I can never guess. Know what I just did? That no. Ever guess. I'm drawing the number three in the air. Oh. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So uh, Ace, uh, you got me on that one. Odd one. <laughs> ever guess. Yeah, and also notice the uh, my my wording. I say a really odd one. Odd. Hello. Odd number. I automatically also, went to an odd number. I noticed that after I said it. See, it's all the subliminal stuff. That's why you thought of a three, Laura. Okay. The suit was off. I don't care. And that's the thing. Okay, here are my closing thoughts. Uh, you know, I'm just going to try to cram this in. Psychological forces. My feeling is that if you have a 100% way of revealing something, like invisible deck or index or whatever, if you got a way to reveal something with 100% uh, accuracy and 100% confidence, 100% competency, 100% foolproof, then take the gamble and do a psychological force because a psychological force is never 100%. You can work on it until so it's like a high 80 or 90%, but it's a gamble. But why take the risk? Because if you score with it, the right people will build churches to you, okay? All right. Well, even though you only got half of that correct, I was very impressed that you even came up with the three and didn't understand how you had forced that on me. There you go, see? So the fact that I came close, again, that's a cold reading thing, you know, wow, that was pretty close, you know? And also notice, I, I was going for the three of hearts, but you notice that here are a few things. I say, you wouldn't be thinking of the three of hearts, would you? I, that's the kind of verbally ambiguous statement. It's like a question, but not a question. Okay? Because, right, so if you're wrong, you can say, of course. Because it's a question, and you say, no, and I'm like, I thought not. Now I can just shrug it off. You know, Max Maven said it. If the psychological force scores, great, you've got a miracle. If it if it doesn't score, then it never happened. But because I have the deck in the spectator's hands, I could I immediately shift gears and say, I thought not, but you'll notice that the cards have been in your hand the entire time. So I sell them on that. So they forget that the uh, the verbal miscall ever happened in the first place. Because it, then they think, oh, he's just saying just an indifferent card just for its own sake. Okay. And you, and you use the memorized deck to count how many cards down to get to the three yeah, parts? Routine is uh, Juan Tom Reese's Mnemonicosis, which is, again, it's in his book. And I figured if I'm going to do Mnemonicosis, I might as well take Gamble and do, introduce it with a psychological force. Now, a few tidbits. Now, again, I'm doing this in somebody's hand. What I'm doing in somebody's hand is I'm doing a zero shuffle in their hand. Suspend disbelief. I'm, I'm working with a table, but imagine that this is in somebody's hand, and I'm doing a zero shuffle in their hand. Okay? That sets that up. Okay? So that then, no matter what card they name, I can do a hands-off navigation to their card. Okay? This, so this is yeah. basically my... So if I score with a psychological force, awesome! In fact, if I score with a psychological force in front of a group of people, not one-on-one, -on -one, but a group of people... That's even more awesome because in a group of people, one of several things can happen. Either I, worst case scenario, I don't score with anybody. Great. Best case scenario, I score with the person I'm dealing with. Better scenario, I'm scoring with more than one person that got influenced by the psychological force. Really cool situation is the person I'm doing it directly for doesn't think of it, but somebody else in the same group did. Ah, uh, 
Then you can say, oh, I must be pulling up your energy. But intercepted with, with hers, you know? So yeah. you know, this person's thoughts instead. I'm sorry about that. And then you've always got I, the, the physical... I use that. Okay? You've always got the physical revelation after the fact. So the thing is, when you're doing a psychological force, always do it with 100% backup. That's my advice. Always do it with 100% backup. I mean, this mnemonicosis is a lot more advanced. You really have to know a memorized deck cold in order to do something like this. Uh, you can always do, you know, store-bought invisible deck. That works fine, okay? You could use an uh, index system like uh, with Daniel Madison's Advocate, which I also use. That works excellent. Uh, brainwave deck, anything that allows you to reveal a card with 100%, you know, physically, that becomes your backup for the psychological force. So if the psychological force fails, you've always got that. Best case scenario, you score with the psychological force. You've all, and now you've got the physical revelation to follow up with. The extra bang for your buck. Precisely. Furthermore, I've actually had people call me, uh, uh, you know, call me on it and say, oh, you did this whole thing, you know, you drew the number, you went, da, 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 da. and I'm like, I went with it. I actually said, you know, a, uh, a lesser person might feel embarrassed, but I'm like, you know, you're right, you caught on to that. You caught on to these very obvious uh, gestures. That means you're very observant. I was counting on that because I was hoping for you to use that and not respond to it directly. You're too intelligent for that, so you're going to think of a different card, aren't you? What's your different card? Seven of diamonds. And then, you know, one, two, three. I kill them that way. So then even if somebody catches me on the psychological force, I just use that to my advantage. Like, of course you caught that. You're too intelligent to fall for such cheap tactics. That means you're going to think of a different card entirely. What was the card you were thinking of, actually? You know, whatever card the name, and then you nail it on them. Then in their mind, they're like, oh, he did that as like a form of reverse psychology. Okay? Uh, he did all that just so I would think of this card. He got me the son of a... You got me. <laughs> that was very uh, cool. Yeah, and my alpha, beta, delta routines, gamma routines... I designed those routines such that they start with a psychological force of some kind and then they end with some kind of 100% backup. So this is one of my basic ones. This is the one I use the most often. That's why it's my alpha routine. Questions? Comments? Questions? Comments? Okay. Uh, no, I think we're good. I think we've uh, spent our time pretty good Today, we have done fantastic. Okay, good. I guess more and more people will be encouraged to pick my brains and all this other stuff. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you, Robin. You have been absolutely wonderful. I really loved this, uh, the, all of the concepts that you said about presentation and everything. It was just a fantastic Q&A. Thank you so much. I'm glad I can contribute to FCM and the holdout. And thank you all for showing up. And have a great evening. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Uh, Michael, Dave, Laura, of course, who's been hosting all this. Uh, I already said Michael. Nick, uh, Ray, I'm just going down the li list of James. Okay. And uh, uh, Nick again. Oh, yeah. Andy. Yeah, I mentioned you already. Andy. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, I mentioned James already. Oh, Dave friended me. That's cool. Hey, Dave, we're friends now. All right. That's it. Please. See you. See you in La La Land or cyberspace or whatever the modern terminology happens to be. Thank you. Peace out. Peace.